our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. It is indeed a pleasure for us to welcome you this morning to Ty- Tyson Tabernacle, the Church of God is Good, where we are here to worship and to magnify the name of the Lord and bring you the word that God has shared with us to share with you on today. Won't you push that share button as we enter into praise and worship to let your friends and families and neighbors and even your enemies know that the Lord is here and he's getting ready to speak to all of us through our pastor, Bishop C. Sean Tyson. As you are pushing that share button, won't you grab your Bibles and let's begin to worship the Lord. As you can hear, pastor is already into it. The song says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. And we got up this afternoon, this morning, in order to worship the Lord. So you can put your hands together right where you are, and let's begin to worship and welcome Christ Church Apostolic and Calvary Ministries International and to all of our friends. Oh, give thanks. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. you to tune in to our prayer line every weekday morning at 6 a.m. and at 12 noon. And that prayer line number, it's on the screen in front of you. It's 720-650-3030. Once again, that's 720-650-3030. The access code is 589-742. That access code again is 589-742. We want you also, those of you who have been asking concerning giving, how that you can give into Calvary Ministries International. You can give by um, cash app, just go to dollar sign MTC Youngstown, or you can give online. Give online through PayPal or Giplify to Mount Calvary Pentecostal Church. Or you can donate at www.calvaryforyou.org. That's www.calvary, the number four, the letter U, dot org. 
or you can give by mail. You can send it to 1812 Oak Hill Avenue, Youngstown, Ohio, 44507. Also, we have another avenue if you're wanting to give, and especially to Mount Calvary members, in giving your tithing and your offering, make sure that you are giving your tithing and your offering. You also are able to bring it by the church. Bring it by the church on Mondays. You can bring it by the church on Mondays at 11 o'clock. Now that's only from 11 o'clock until one o'clock if you don't wanna send it in the mail. Ah, we're preparing ourselves to hear the word of the Lord. Are you ready to hear the word? I know that you are. God has really been blessing us through the word of God that the man of God has been bringing forth. And without further ado, I present to you Bishop C. Sean Tyson. God bless you today, saints and friends. Thank you for joining us again for Midday Manor. Here at the Tyson Tabernacle Church of God is good in the city of Youngstown, Ohio. And we're grateful for another opportunity to share God's word and God's mind with you on today. Now, today will be our fourth lesson on the general subject, how to protect your mind in troubling times. That has been our general subject for this week. How to protect your mind in troubling times. And we're dealing today with the conclusion of yesterday's subtopic, how to overcome depression and anxiety. This is such an important and critical subject. If you will be so kind to share this live webcast with all your friends, start web start watch parties. We want to share this critical information with as many individuals as we can, how to overcome depression and anxiety. Let us begin by reading our thematic scripture for the week. Isaiah chapter 26, verse number three. Let's read it together aloud, please. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. Down to verse number 12, reading together aloud, please. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us, for thou also hast wrought all our works in us. Now, Lord, speak unto us and illuminate our minds by the power of the Holy Spirit giving us direction, revelation, and understanding through thy holy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For the benefit of those of you that are joining us for the first time in this series on mental health and wellness, I'd like to review the key principles we have shared thus far in lessons one, two, and three. And then we will quickly proceed with today's lesson. I'm going to receive a few questions today at the end of the lesson. So if while I'm moving through the lesson, you have a question that you would like for me to attempt to answer, just place your question in the comment section and at the end of the lesson, I will attempt to answer a few questions to the best of my ability before we leave the air today. Thus far, we have established in our first three lessons on mental health and wellness, these seven foundational principles. Let us review them. Number one, the mind is the strategic and ultimate battleground in spiritual warfare. That is foundational principle number one. Number two, the status of our mental wellness was included in John's wish for the saints to prosper and be in health as is written in 3 John chapter one and verse number two. 
Let's look at number three, please. The third foundational principle. Mental health involves our spiritual, emotional, psychological, physiological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act. It also helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others, and make decisions. Foundational principle number four. Great spiritual exploits does not make one exempt from mental challenges and may in fact make an individual more susceptible to them. Fifth foundational principle. The acknowledgement of one's humanity is not a denial of Christ's deity. We are spiritual beings navigated by the Holy Spirit through a human experience. Let's look at the sixth foundational principle together. Every strong person has weaknesses. Every weak person has strengths. Therefore, our mental wellness is largely dependent upon developing the discipline to keep our minds stayed upon God. Let us notice the seventh and final foundational principle from lessons one, two, and three. Therapy, when needed, should not be thought of as a contradiction to one's faith, but rather as a compliment. For the wisdom of God is as essential to the healing of the mind as the power of God is to the healing of the body. So those are the seven foundational principles that we have learned thus far in this series on mental health and wellness. On yesterday, we began to share 10 practical application principles on how to deal with depression and anxiety from the scriptures. We stopped yesterday at number five, and we will pick up in just a few moments at number six, but let us just briefly review directives one through five. 10 biblical directives to overcome depression and anxiety. Let's look at number one together. Don't ignore it, acknowledge it. We learn that we cannot conquer what we will not confront. We cannot conquer what we will not confront. The other key principle in relationship to that insight is the impartation of God's strength begins with the acknowledgement of our weakness. Let us look at number two, directive number two from the scripture, how to overcome depression and anxiety. Number two, depression is a part of the process of becoming your stronger self. Depression is a part of the process of becoming your stronger self. Let's look at a principle in relationship to that. The light I walk in is the other side of the darkness I walk through. The light that I walk in is the other side of the darkness I've walked through. Proverbs 4.18, but the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Let us review the third directive. According to the scripture, how to overcome depression and anxiety. Because what you are dealing with is difficult, does not mean it is not doable. It means what you're striving for is valuable. 
and you are worth the work. Remember the principle that we share? Don't feel guilty about taking care of yourself. It's not being selfish. It is self-esteem and it is the appropriate self-worth that the scripture says we should ascribe to ourselves. For we must love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Let us review the fourth directive from the scripture on how to overcome depression and anxiety. Number four. What's coming into your life will be better than what's leaving your life. You've got to believe that and receive it by faith. Your latter shall be greater than your former. Let's look at the fifth directive on how to overcome depression and anxiety, and then we'll be ready to move forward to today's lesson at number six. Depression enables you to recalibrate yourself at a higher level. What a child of God must be confident of is that whatever God allows to come into your life is designed for your good and for his glory. Even if it was precipitated by Satan, what the enemy meant for evil, God will make work out for your good. For this cause, we say depression enables you to recalibrate yourself at a higher level. The word recalibrate, we learn, means to bring back to an original place, back to an original condition. You can get your mind back. Trust me on that. When it gotten away from you, your mind back. Let's look at a principle in relationship to mental recalibration. You may be at your worst while you're going through, but stay the course because you will be at your best when you come out. Now let us move to the conclusion of this lesson and consider Directive 6 through 10 from the scriptures, how to overcome depression and anxiety. Let us observe number six together. Remember, if you have any questions while I'm moving through, just type your question in the comment section and I'll attempt to answer a few at the end of this lesson. Let's look at number six. Do not perceive depression and anxiety as who you are, but part of a process that you are passing through. Do not interpret depression and anxiety as who you are, but it is part of a process you are passing through. Now to this point, I want to share with you that when the enemy is attacking your mind, one of his primary tactics is to attempt to make you doubt your identity in Christ. You will recall in Matthew chapter four, when Satan was attacking Jesus' mind in the wilderness during Jesus' 40 day fast, Satan would preface his comments to Jesus by saying, if thou be the son of God, do X, Y, and Z, attempting to make Christ unsure about his identity. And he uses that same weapon against us when he's attacking our mind. Let me pause here to say, you don't have anything to prove to the devil or any of his human co-workers. Let's look at the next principle, please. Your circumstance 
is not your identity. You are who God says you are. I want you to receive that in your spirit. You are who God says you are. Who does God say we are? Let us notice 10 characteristics of our identity in Christ. When you know who you are, the devil cannot be successful in some of these mind games that he's been playing with us. 10 characteristics of our identity in Christ. Number one, I want everyone that's watching this webcast to say out loud, I am God's child. Say it again. I am God's child. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 26. Let's read it together. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Let's look at number two. What is our identity in Christ? I am Jesus' friend. What an amazing testimony to be the friend of God. John chapter 15 and verse number 15. Let's read it together, please. Aloud, everyone. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made them known unto you. Let's look at our third characteristic, the third characteristic of our identity in Christ. Number three, I am a whole new person with a whole new life. Once I am born again of water and of spirit. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse number 17. I'm a whole new person with a whole new life. Let's read together verse 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You know, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Let's look at our fourth characteristic, the fourth characteristic of our identity in Christ. I am a place where God's spirit lives. To all of my friends viewing this webcast, I want to implore you, encourage you to seek God for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You say, well, Pastor Tyson, I've heard about that. I've heard some interesting things about it. And perhaps some of you have been told the baptism of the Holy Spirit isn't for everyone. That's not true. That the baptism of the Holy Spirit is only for a particular group of people. That's not true. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is for whomsoever shall call upon the name of the Lord that sincerely desires to be filled with God's Spirit. And I believe that's you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. The church can't be shut down because you are the temple of the Holy Ghost, which ye have of God, and because you belong to God, it instructs every aspect of our conduct, our character, and our behavior because ye are not your own. Let's look at number five. What is the fifth characteristic of our identity in Christ? So you need to know who you are, which will help you regulate your mind when the adversary comes to attack it. Number five, I am God's incredible work of art. Used to say, God don't make no junk, and it's the truth. Each and every one of you are an exclusive masterpiece, the direct manifestation of the mind of God 
and the likeness and the image of God himself. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10. Read it together aloud with me, please, class. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Let's look at our sixth characteristic, the sixth characteristic of our identity in Christ. This is very important for many of us. I want you to say this out loud with me, please. I am totally and completely forgiven. One more time. Say it with me. I am totally and completely forgiven. Let's read the scripture on that matter. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I was just sharing with a saint on last night who was struggling in their mind over a past failure, my instruction to them was, don't you remember what God has forgotten? You have to release it and receive God's forgiveness, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching to those things that are before Receive God's forgiveness, and don't you remember what God has forgotten? Number seven. What is the, our seventh characteristic, the seventh characteristic of our identity in Christ? We are created in God's likeness. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 24. So then, because we are created in the likeness of God through the power of the Holy Spirit and the wisdom of God, we have the ability to think like God thinks. Ephesians 4 and 24. And that he put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Number eight. Who are we in Christ? I am spiritually alive. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 5. Let's read it together. Even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved. Number 9. Who are we in Christ? We are citizens of of the heavenly kingdom. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 20. I am a citizen of heaven. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're in the world, but we are not of the world. Our conversation is in heaven. We get our orders from headquarters and it is our daily objective that the will of God be done in us as it is in heaven. Then finally, number 10, our identity in Christ. We are greatly loved by the Father. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8. Shall we read it together? But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now let us move forward to the seventh directive from the scripture on how to overcome depression and anxiety. Number seven, hold on to the fundamental sustaining power of faith to increase knowledge 
without increasing faith creates an imbalance that causes inherent frustration. Many of us are fighting in our mind because we are trying to figure out what can only be comprehended by faith. And even when faith is involved, there are times when we are not going to know why God does certain things or understand the way that he does certain things. So we have to make a fundamental commitment to have faith in God. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse number 13. Some of us are about driving ourselves crazy, trying to figure out the why of God. But when you can't figure out the why of God, you can trust the who of God. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 13. And I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. I commune with my own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart hath great experience of wisdom and knowledge. Verse 17, and I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I found out that this also is vexation of spirit. Verse 18, for in much wisdom, that is the wisdom of man, is much grief. And he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. Now, if you know anything about our background and our ministry, if you knew anything about my father, the early great Bishop James Edison Tyson, or the early great Bishop Norman L. Wagner, you know that we believe 200% in education. That is one of the pillar principles of the pursuit of godliness and a holistic life in our ministry culture. But do understand that you can be too smart for your own God. Do you hear the mind of God? You can be too smart for your own God and for your own good. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And we must trust that God's way and God's will is ultimately for our good. Let us look at the eighth biblical directive on how to overcome depression and anxiety. I want to be clear in what I'm saying in principle number seven. We are not advocating ignorance at all. What we are saying that there is a place in the human experience where the will of God transcends the human understanding of man. Let's move forward to number eight. Please hear me on this, beloved. Suicide is a permanent choice to a temporary situation. Decide to live. Oh, I felt God just grab a hold of somebody. Suicide is a permanent choice to a temporary situation. What should I do, Reverend Tyson? Decide to live. Oh, I need at least 100 people to type in that comment section now. It's going to pull somebody back from the brink. Decide to to live. Read with me Psalm 118, verse number 13. Psalm 118, verse 13. 
Read that with me while you're deciding to live. Thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall. But the Lord helped me. Remember I told you that you are not in this by yourself? There's at least 300 of us watching the webcast right now that were on the brink of ending it all. You say, well, how did you manage to make it through? Why are you still here? Here's the answer in the last clause of verse 13. But the Lord helped me. When we couldn't help ourselves, the Lord helped us. The same God that helped us is going to help you. I promise you that. Let's read verse number 17. I need everyone to read this out loud, and I want you to read it with confidence. Let's go. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of of the Lord. Friend, you're going to make it through this and they're going to live to tell the testimony. And it is so, saith the Lord. Let me hurry to a close so I can answer a few questions if you have any. The night directing on how to overcome depression and anxiety. Number nine, do not let fatigue rob you of your future. I have been so tired in my mind, so weary in my spirit, so done with it, so at my wits end, so frustrated, so overwhelmed, I just said, forget it. Don't let fatigue rob you of your future. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 29. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might he increaseth strength. Verse 30. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. My daddy used to say that trouble is an equal opportunity employment. Trouble doesn't care how old you are, how young you are, how rich you are, how poor you are, how black you are, how white you are. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. That's the bad news, but give me the good news. In verse number 31, come on, read it. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Beloved, don't you know that God has never made a promise that he hasn't kept? They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faith. Galatians 6 and 9 says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If I be a man of God, the Holy Ghost just told me to tell you that are watching me not your due season has come. I praise his name. Let's get ready to close. Number 10, and we're finished. The 10th directive from the scripture, how to overcome depression and anxiety. Number 10, take the wisdom and the strength that you have acquired through your pain and use it to empower others. Take the wisdom and strength that you have acquired through your pain and use it.
to empower others. Job chapter 42, verse number 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he took his focus off his pain, when he took his focus off his loss, when he took his focus off his hurt and prayed for his friends. Well, let's quickly review the 10 ways, according to the scripture, to overcome anxiety and depression. And then I'll try to answer a few questions before I leave the air. Number one, don't ignore it. In order to conquer it, you must confront it. Number two, depression is a natural part of the process of becoming your stronger self. Number three, because it is difficult does not mean it's not doable. It means it is valuable and you are worth the work. Number four, what's coming into your life will be better than what's leaving your life because what you're going through is not permanent, it's temporary. Number five, depression enables you to recalibrate yourself at a higher level. You'll be stronger mentally. You'll be stronger in your faith. You'll be stronger in your character when you come through this. Number six, do not perceive depression and anxiety as who you are, but something you are passing through. Do not personalize it and do not internalize it. Number seven, Hold on to the fundamental sustaining power of faith to increase knowledge without increasing faith creates an imbalance that causes inherent frustration per the teachings of Solomon. Number eight, suicide is a permanent choice to a temporary decision decide to live. Number nine, don't let fatigue rob you of your future. You will recover. Number 10, take the wisdom and strength that you have acquired through your pain and use it to empower others. Well, this concludes our teaching on the subject of how to overcome anxiety and depression. If you have any questions for me before I leave there, I'll try to answer a few if you have any. Before we leave there, just type your question in the comment section. And if you have no questions for me today, I'm going to leave the word of the Lord with you and pray that this lesson has been a blessing to your spirit, your mind, and your body. Well, we will conclude tomorrow at 1 p.m. this week's series, How to Protect Your Mind in Troubling Times. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the wisdom. We thank you for the enlightenment and the power of the spirit. Now I pray that these believers will receive by faith the word of instruction, the word of encouragement, the word of empowerment that you have spoken through your son and your servant. Now grant unto each and every one under the sound of my voice and the influence of this prayer, the peace of God that passes all understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you and heaven smile upon you. Be sure to join me tonight at 7 p.m. at Mount Calvary Facebook Live.
I got my dates a little mixed up on Tuesday, and I announced on Tuesday that Elder Brandon Hollis was preaching on Tuesday night, when all, all actuality, our son, Minister Aaron Coward, delivered a powerful lesson on Tuesday night. So tonight, National Evangelist Elder Brandon Hollis, another of our sons in the gospel, will be preaching the gospel tonight on the Mount Calvary webcast at 7 p.m. And I look forward to seeing you there. Have a supernatural day, and I'll see you tomorrow at 1 o'clock.